We left off last time. We were looking at the end of part two of the structure in Galt's speech. So I want to finish that today um, and get to part three. And then hopefully we'll have some time um, to discuss a, some points uh, basically about the sanction of the victim that come up in part three um, and looking at the connection in Atlas. Um, now, we, we left off talking about the mystic and how wishing was his ideal world, um, a, a world where wishing works. And I think I had basically finished that point. There, there's one, uh, one additional point I wanted to make about that because it's, it's a kind of a theme running through the, this last section of part two, all the, all the six points as I've divided it up. And the theme, it's a minor theme that what attracts the um, people of the nation and the world, the, the semi-rational people, as Galt puts it, what attracts them to the doctrine of the mystics is um, the, the same kind of ideal, uh, so a world where wishing works on a much lesser scale. <clears throat> so for instance, uh, in this section, where, where he's talking about wishing. Um, uh, three paragraphs after that on page 150, uh, paragraph 155, Galt says, there is no honest revolt against reason. And when you accept any part of their creed, your motive is to get away with something your reason would not permit you to attempt. <clears throat> so what attracts them to the, to the code and the, the morality of death and the, and the deeper philosophy that's advocated by the mystics is the same um, is the same phenomenon as, as what causes the mystics to advocate it, but on a lesser scale. <clears throat> so here it's to put something above reason, as as the mystic pushes puts a wish above reason, <clears throat> and and you get a point like that running through uh, this whole last section. So are there any questions about that? point two before we move on to point three. <clears throat> okay, let's go to, we're going to, I'm going to try to go through three, four, and five uh, fairly quickly because of lack of time. And I think the last point, the uh, point on the birth of a mystic is worth discussing in some detail. <clears throat> so the next point we get is really a deeper a kind of philosophical conceptualization of what it means to make your wish uh, in a world where your wish would rule, what that means in terms of philosophical principles. And basically what it means is the primacy of consciousness. And so that's what we get here. That, um, and, and that will be tied to why they always seek to rebel and deny causality. So if you look um, on page 151, <clears throat> uh, well, 150, and then uh, paragraphs 160 and 161. He says, your teachers, the mystics of both schools, have reversed causality in their consciousness, then strive to reverse it in existence. They take their emotions as a cause <clears throat> and their mind as a passive effect. They make their emotions their tool for perceiving reality. And then skipping to the next paragraph, they say, they want to cheat the axiom of existence and consciousness. They want consciousness to be an instrument, not of perceiving, but of creating existence. And existence to be the ob not the object, but the subject of their consciousness. They want to be that God they created in their image and likeness, who creates a universe out of a void by means of an arbitrary whim. <clears throat> so that's, I mean, it's basically the same idea as the idea that they want a wish above or to control reality, but it's put in uh, philosophical terms, in terms of the axiom. And basically, the reason they want to reverse causality, <clears throat> or, or to, to dissolve, and why they rebel against causality, it was because they need a world, or to convince themselves that the world is such that wishing works. <clears throat> so they have to deny the actual reason for uh, what controls the actions and events in the world, namely the entity and its nature. So that's what they have to blank out in order to preserve the illusion 
that it's a wish, their wish that controls reality. <clears throat> so, and this is why we get discussion of causality here, because it's, it's motivated here. It wasn't necessary in presenting the foundation of the morality of life. <clears throat> um, and so if you look on, this is 151, paragraph 161, he says, quote, the links you strive to drown are causal connections. The enemy you seek to defeat is the law of causality. It permits you no miracles. And that's what, I mean, a wish, wishing is, <clears throat> the wish for a miracle. The law of causality is the law of identity applied to action. All actions are caused by entities. The nature of an action is caused and determined by the nature of the entities that act. A thing cannot act in contradiction to its nature. An action not caused by an entity would be caused by a zero, which would mean a zero controlling the thing, a non-entity controlling an entity, the non-existent ruling the existent, which is the universe of your teacher's desire, the cause of their doctrine of causeless action, the reason for their revolt against reason, the goal of their morality, their politics, their economics, the ideal they strive for, the reign of the zero. <clears throat> And, and again, in this section, I won't, I won't mention the actual paragraph, we get the idea that it's the same uh, thing on a lesser scale, the primacy of consciousness, that attracts uh, the people of the world to the mystic's ideal. Okay, that's it for point three. Any questions on that? <clears throat> okay, point four. <clears throat> If they need this world where a zero controls action and events, <clears throat> then what the actual cause of all the values and all the things that they uh, supposedly strive for, the men of the mind, the cause of the causeless, as Gall puts it, have to be blanked out. <clears throat> In order to preserve the illusion that wishing works, they have to blank out the actual cause of all the things uh, that, they, that they covet. <clears throat> So, this is um, 152, paragraph 165. Galt says, we are the cause of all the values that you covet. We who perform the process of thinking, as we talked about, the thinking um, is, is the basic way you preserve the primacy of, of existence. <clears throat> the process of thinking, which is the process of defining identity and discovering causal connections which is exactly what they blank out. <clears throat> we taught you to know, to speak, to produce, to desire, to love. You who abandon reason, were it not for us who preserve it, you would not be able to fulfill or even to conceive your wishes. You would not, able, you would not be able to desire the clothes that had not been made, the automobile, automobile that had not been invented, the money that had not been devised <clears throat> as exchange for goods that did not exist, the admiration that had, been, had, that had not been experienced for men, who had achieved nothing, the love that belongs and pertains only to those who preserve their capacity to think, to choose, to value. <clears throat> so that's what they have to blank out. And we get a point here, I think this is one of the um, few places where we get a, a substantive point uh, about a distinction between the mystics of spirit and the mystics of matter. And I think here we get a perspective that the mystics of matter are even worse than the mystics of spirit, because <clears throat> the mystics of spirit blanked out the men of the mind, the men of ability, by labeling them as sinners. <clears throat> but that's still a label. It's still some acknowledgment uh, of their existence. <clears throat> and now, the, Galt says, this is uh, 153, 169, uh, and now is italicized. Now we are chained and commanded to produce by savages who do not grant us even the identification of sinners by savages who proclaim that we do not exist, then threaten to deprive us of the life we don't possess, possess if we fail to provide them with the goods we don't produce. <clears throat> <clears throat> and the, the mystics of muscle are, are the ones who, uh, I mean, they're the materialists, the ones who deny the mind completely. <clears throat> and we get the point here, um, that uh, just as they tried to steal the, uh, all the products of the producers, <clears throat> of industrial plants and, fac and, and factories and so on, <clears throat> so the mystics of uh, 
muscle or trying to steal all of thought. <clears throat> so not just the, the results of production, but the results of all thought. <clears throat> and this is, this is why we get the idea of the stolen concept here. <clears throat> And how it goes all the way to root, uh, I mean, to rock bottom of concepts. They, they, they try to steal all thought by rejecting the base of all thought, the axioms. <clears throat> and here we get, um, I think this ties into the, the, the minor theme that I said running through this section that what attracts um, the people of the world to the doctrine, uh, to the doctrines of the mystics is, um, is, is evasion on a lesser scale than. The, uh, the actual mystics. And um, I think, I mean, I don't want to go into this in detail, but I think the, the discussion of the axioms, you get that point too, that you have to uh, evade. It's to, to, to try to attack and reject the axioms is a willful uh, defiance of reason and reality. And um, <clears throat> to the extent that the, the people of the nation and the world do that, they're also willfully blanking out, rejecting reality. <clears throat> and this, this ties into point five, to the idea um, <clears throat> that the, 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 the deepest goal of the mystics is to deprive you of the concept of an objective reality. <clears throat> and the concept of an objective reality hinges on a distinction between existence and consciousness which is an, a, a distinction that Ayn Rand says a savage can't uh, grasp. And that's what they want to reduce you to. <clears throat> and to reduce you to that, to, to rejecting the axioms of existence and consciousness, requires your willful participation. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, so first to get what they're trying to do, and then uh, some idea that this is, uh, it requires a surrender. It's not just an error. Um, this is page 157, uh, paragraph 180, towards probably the, the second third of it. <laughs> Galt says, talking about a savage, crawling on his belly in fear and worship of sun and moon and wind and rain, and of any thug who announces himself as their <clears throat> spokesman, provided his words are unintelligible and his mask sufficiently frightening. He wishes, begs, and crawls, and dies leaving you as a record of his view of existence, the distorted monstrosity of his idols, part man, part animal, part spider, the embodiments of the world of non a His is the intellectual state of your modern teachers, and his is the world to which they want to bring you. <clears throat> and then this is on 158, paragraph 184. He says, if you surrender your power to proceed, if you accept the switch of your standard from the objective to the collective and wait for mankind to tell you what to think, you will find another switch taking place before the eyes you have renounced. <clears throat> you will find that your teachers become the rulers of the collective. And if, and if you then refuse to obey them, protesting that they are not the whole of mankind, they will answer, by what means do you know that we are not our brother where did you get such an old-fashioned term? <clears throat> so that's their ultimate goal, to rule over people. By dissolving in them um, the, the, the very concept of a mind, that they have a tool of survival, and then they're completely helpless. <clears throat> but it requires um, uh, your surrender, that your, your actual renouncing of your rational faculty. Okay, that's highly condensed for those uh, points, but uh, I'm doing that for lack of time. So anything before we get to the last point, I think, is worth uh, discussing in some detail. As I said, the, the last point I have is his success requires your consent, the birth of a mystic. And here we get um, the explanation of why they're haters of the good for being the good. And I think it's worth um, pausing on that to try to unpack that. So any questions before? Moving to the last point. Sure, in the back. I guess I can envision Bill Clinton one, wanting to be a ruler, wanting to hold power. I find it hard to picture the professors of philosophy being that. They just don't seem that. They seem more impotent than that. 
Um, so could you comment on, if we were to concretize now, who wants to collect? You know what I mean? Uh, well, but it, I think it depends on what you view as power. I mean, the, the professor of, of philosophy want a certain power over people's mind, and they, they kind of go hand in hand. This is a point that comes up in this last section that he says, um, every mystic is a potential dictator. <clears throat> so th there is a, a seeking of power over people's minds. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, uh, in the form of a dictator trying to force uh, a, a nation or so on. But, but they're looking for the surrender of minds. Anything else? <clears throat> okay, let's go. This is a, a difficult section, I think, but worth trying to unpack a little bit. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the first point we get here um, is that the, the mystic requires the surrender. He requires the surrender of your consciousness. <clears throat> So when he starts attacking the power of the mind, and he, and he says it's impotent, it's useless, uh, that your senses are invalid, and so on, <clears throat> what he wants is for you to doubt your own mind, not his. I mean, that's the proper thing. If someone's telling you uh, he's blind and he doesn't know anything, and so on, you <clears throat> doubt the power of his mind, um, not your own. <clears throat> And he needs that surrender because it's actually your mind, your consciousness, that he views as powerful. <clears throat> and why? That's the question. And here we get an explanation of why. <clears throat> it's in the distinction between uh, they say versus I know. <clears throat> That's the birth of a mystic, Gall tells us. <clears throat> and the idea is this, I think, that when, and we're talking most likely, uh, I mean, when in, as he's developing, um, so a child, a, a teenager, and so on. <clears throat> that when he experiences a clash of judgments, a clash between what he says and what he thinks <clears throat> and what others say, what they say, when he has such a clash, <clears throat> he doesn't focus on reality and let his uh, reason serve as the standard for deciding what's true. <clears throat> he surrenders his reason. He surrenders his judgment. And he goes by the authority of others. He goes by they say, not what he knows. <clears throat> and it's not that he's rationally convinced by what others are saying. It's that he's not rationally convinced, and he still surrenders. He still goes uh, by what they say. To, so to take the kind of uh, situation, I think, that's envisioned here, <clears throat> that would, I think would have to be repeated over, uh, I mean, you would need more than one instance to get a birth of a mystic. But let's say that he has a parent telling him that uh, he should love his relatives even though they're pretty nasty characters. <clears throat> and he asks why. Why should he? And he gets no reason. He, they just tell him, you should. <clears throat> and he accepts that. <clears throat> he believes. <clears throat> he doesn't have any reason for it. It doesn't uh, conform to what he knows. But he surrenders what he knows. And he goes by what they say. And you get, uh, in Atlas, I think you get this in reverse in uh, a characterization of Dagny's childhood. Um, so to take a few examples. So where she's confronted with they say versus I know, and she always chooses I know, not what they say. Um, and I think th these are exactly the kinds of situations Galt has in mind here in this. Uh, so for instance, uh, this is on page 54. <clears throat> Quote, your unbearably conceited was one of the two sentences she heard throughout her childhood, even though she never spoke of her own, own ability. The other sentence was, you're selfish. She asked what was meant, but never received an answer. So that's what they say, but there's no explanation. There's no reason for it. She looked at the adults, wondering how they, they could imagine that she would feel guilt from an undefined accusation. <clears throat> so she goes with what she knows, not with what they say. And then in the next paragraph, she was 12 year old, Ed Locke mentioned this in his uh, general lecture, quote, she was 12 years old when she told Eddie Willers that she would run the railroad when they grew up. She was 15 when it occurred to her for the first time that women did not run railroads and that people might object. <clears throat> to hell with that, she thought, and never worried about it again. <clears throat> so it's again, she's confronted with what they say, that women don't run railroads, and 
she goes by what she knows, that she has the mind and ability to run a railroad, and that's the end of the story. Or in her view of sex, <clears throat> which um, this is after uh, Francisco and she have had sex, and she's <clears throat> we get a similar... Uh, so she obviously knows the value of sex. Um, and then she's thinking about the, what they say about sex. Uh, this is in part what she's thinking. Um, <clears throat> quote, she, this is on 106. Uh, she knew the general doctrine on sex held by people in one form or another, the doctrine that sex was an ugly weakness of man's lower nature, to be condoned regretfully. She experienced an emotion of chastity that made her shrink not from the desires of her body, but from any contact with the minds who held this doctrine. <clears throat> Close quote. So I think, uh, and there are others in, in the characterization of her childhood. We get the exact opposite of what Galt's talking about in the birth of a mystic. <clears throat> now, in surrendering to the, the, what they say versus going by his own judgment and what he knows, <clears throat> the implicit premise is that his mind, his reason, is useless, that it's impotent, that it cannot access the truth, and that they have some unknown means of accessing the truth, of knowing. <clears throat> they have something superior to reason, to the useless thing that is his mind. <clears throat> so to read as Galt describes it, this is on 161, uh, 194. <clears throat> at about the middle of the paragraph, he says, at the crossroads of the choice between I know and they say, he chose the authority of others. He chose to submit rather than to understand, to believe rather than to think. Faith in the supernatural begins as faith in the superiority of others. His surrender took the form of the feeling that he must hide his lack of understanding, that others possess some mysterious knowledge of which he alone is deprived, that reality is whatever they want it to be, through some means forever denied to him. <clears throat> and then uh, a, couple of, a couple of paragraphs after that, he says, quote, when a mystic declares that he feels the existence of a power superior to reason, he feels it all right, but that power is not an omniscient super spirit of the universe. It is the consciousness of any passerby to whom he has surrendered his own. <clears throat> so he's surrendered to other people's consciousness, and he thinks they have some kind of mysterious power superior to reason. <clears throat> so he's accepted the social primacy of consciousness. That others, is the all, others' consciousness is all powerful. And that's what, if he wants to be able to uh, get in conformity with reality, it has to be through their consciousness. He has to gain control over it. Because that's the real uh, knower and master of existence. And so that's the idea of power. We get the idea of power lust here. That they have, the mystic has to control that which he thinks is this mysterious faculty uh, that has uh, some mysterious access to ra reality, other people's consciousness. <clears throat> and why we get we get uh, implicitly the question then: Why um, does he have to deal with other people? through force and not through reason? Why, if he's trying to access their consciousness, <clears throat> why not uh, try to convince them, try to get agreement? Why does he have to force them? <clears throat> and Galt says, uh, so why does he have to deal with them through reason? Uh, sorry, through force, not reason. <clears throat> and Galt says, this is on 161, 190, uh, paragraph 197. <clears throat> He says, reason is the enemy he dreads and simultaneously considers precarious. <clears throat> He's talking about the mystic. That the reason is an enemy he dreads and simultaneously considers precarious. <clears throat> and what does that mean exactly? <clears throat> well, I think, I mean, this is my hypothesis, hypothesis of what that means. <clears throat> he dreads reason because you can't blank out the power of reason completely. So he half knows he half knows that other people's mind, other people's reason, could see him for what he is, <clears throat> which is a loathsome creature who's abandoned his mind, who surrendered his mind. 
And if they see him for what he is, they won't surrender to them. They won't view him as an authority, <clears throat> as someone who uh, they should serve. <clears throat> so reason is his enemy. Other people's reason is his enemy. They can, they can see him for what he is. So that's part of his view of reason. But he also thinks reason is precarious because, he, as we've said, he's surrendered his own mind <clears throat> on, the, on, on the implicit premise that his mind is useless and they have some faculty superior to reason. <clears throat> so he has this kind of dual view of reason. He half knows that other people's mind could see him for what he is, but he also half believes that reason is useless. <clears throat> and that the source of their knowledge, of the they say, is something above facts, above logic. <clears throat> so as Gall puts it, this is on 161, 162, uh, paragraph 197. He says, he feels that men possess some power more potent than reason, and only their causeless belief or their forced obedience can give him a sense of security, a proof that he has gained control of the mystic endowment he lacked. And Galt says uh, a bit later, if he can get others, quote, to fake the reality he orders them to fake, men would, in fact, create it. <clears throat> so think here of a dictator, say, like Stalin, <clears throat> who has these huge statues erected to his honor. Um, he has the forced worship of the whole nation, the school children, textbooks, and so on. Now, he half knows that these people are being, um, being forced and that if they could, they'd slit his throat. <clears throat> Yet he still thinks that uh, if he can get them to fake his greatness, then he will become great. <clears throat> so as Gall puts it, he falls below the level of a lunatic who creates his own distortion of reality to the level of a parasite of lunacy <clears throat> who seeks a distortion created by others. That's exactly the, the mentality of a Stalin. <clears throat> He's a parasite on the faking that he requires of the people of his nation to pretend that he's great. <clears throat> and then we get at the end of this um, why he's a hater of the good for being the good. Galt says, the, feeling that, the feelings that move him are hatred for all values of man's life, life and lust for all the evils that destroy it. And, and why is that? Why does he become a hater in that way? A hater of the good for being the good, of values for being values. <clears throat> well, he needs a world that conforms and validates his default. The fact that he's surrendered and tossed out his mind, <clears throat> that he's gone by the authority of others. He needs a world where th that will make it seem like he was right to renounce his faculty of reason. Now, what kind of world would justify renouncing your faculty of reason? Well, a world where reason and the mind are impotent. <clears throat> a, a world where they don't work. <clears throat> so, Galt says, uh, this is on 162. <clears throat> um, a mystic relishes the spectacle of suffering, of poverty, of subservience, of terror. These give him, give him a feeling of triumph, a proof of the defeat of rational reality. <clears throat> but no other reality exists. <clears throat> I think that's a very, I mean, it, it's condensed, but a very uh, revealing statement. The, the idea of a rational reality. I don't, I looked through uh, the objectivist corpus um, in preparation for this. I couldn't find another place, and I don't re remember another place, where she uses the term rational reality. <clears throat> I mean, you get, obviously, reality, facts of reality all over, and you get the idea of an objective reality. But the idea of a rational reality <clears throat> is an, an idea where reality works, <clears throat> where reason works, and that's what he needs the defeat of. But no other reality exists. <clears throat> if that's what you need to have defeated, the, the part of reality where reason works. Well, that's all of reality. <clears throat> and so he's at war with all of reality. 
And so Gall puts it, this is 162, paragraph 200. He says, in fact, in reality, on earth, his ideal is death. His craving is to kill. His only satisfaction is torture. Destruction is the only end that the mystic's creed has ever achieved, as it is the only end, and, and it is, as it is the only end you see them achieving today. And if the ravages wrought by their acts have not made them question their doctrines, if they profess to be moved by love, yet are not deterred by piles of human corpses, it is because the truth about their souls is worse than the obscene excuse you have allowed them, the excuse that the end justifies the means and that the horrors they practice are means to nobler ends. The truth is that those horrors are their ends. <clears throat> Close quote. <clears throat> and that, uh, as, as Galt tells the people of the nation, is the fundamental reason why no compromise is possible with uh, those on the morality of death. I mean, death is their ideal. You being dead is uh, what they're after, what is there to negotiate about. Okay, that's what I have for, I mean, that's a condensed view of part two. Are there any questions about that last point, the birth of the mystic? <clears throat> okay, well, let's then turn to the structure of part three. And I think the structure of part three, we can, I can quickly sketch. There's one section that uh, requires um, some detailed discussion, but the other, the rest of it, I think um, it's easy to point out the structure and to see the flow of the argument. <clears throat> and remember, the, we had the question of part three. Why do you need this lengthy part three? If he's, if he's presented the morality of life and the morality of death, and he's saying, now choose, the choice seems pretty obvious. I mean, you're going to side with the morality of life. And it's here in part three and uh, after the first section where we get um, an explanation of why uh, they, they still have so much trouble choosing, choosing the side of life. So the, the first section basically makes the point that um, Galt has put an end to uh, the morality of death, and he's put an end to the possibility of compromising, <clears throat> that he's des destroyed the middle of the road. <clears throat> and so they're going to have to choose one way or the other. And he's destroyed it by, by, by identifying the principle of the sanction of the victim and withdrawing the good who have been uh, keeping the world up and keeping uh, the people of the nation from the consequences of the morality they've adopted. <clears throat> and it's, it's in section B that we get uh, the, the first explanation of why they face such a difficult choice, why it's so difficult for them to choose the side of life. I have this section as recognize that you believe uh, morality is a necessary evil. And this is the section I think that needs uh, some unpacking to, to understand the whole structure of this last uh, part, uh, of this part three, the last part. <clears throat> so it starts off, <clears throat> uh, this is on page 170, Galt's telling them that they have, they have a final choice. He says, um, this is this is two twenty, paragraph 228. He says, But to those of you who still retain a remnant of the dignity and will to love one's life, I'm offering the chance to make a choice. Choose whether you wish to perish for a morality you never believed or practiced. Pause on the brink of self-destruction and examine your values and your life. <clears throat> you had known how to take an inventory of your wealth. Now take an inventory of your mind. <clears throat> and the the first point we get here is that uh, they have no desire to be moral. Now he's addressing the people, the, the semi-rational people. <clears throat> they have no desire to be moral, i.e. they have no desire to, to, to act on the morality of death. 
but they view this as something bad in them. So he says, since this is 229, since childhood you have been hiding the guilty secret, that you feel no desire to be moral, no desire to seek self-immolation, that you dread and hate your code, but dare not say it even to yourself, that you're devoid of those moral instincts which others profess to feel, the less you felt, the louder you proclaim your selfless love and servitude of others to, to others, in dread of ever letting them discover your own self. <clears throat> so they have no desire to be moral, <clears throat> but they also can't reject their code, and they go around faking that they are practicing it and adopting the code. And the result of that, <clears throat> it's, so it's a kind of compromised position where they're half accepting the code, but they accept what Galt calls the lethal tenet, the, the distinction uh, or the dichotomy between the moral and the practical. <clears throat> he says, um, this is in uh, 171, page 230, <clears throat> no matter what dishonorable compromise you've made with your impractical, impracticable creed, no matter what miserable balance, half cynicism, half superstition, you manage to maintain, you still preserve the root, the lethal tenet, the belief that the moral and the practical are opposites. <clears throat> and then Galt says, the sole result of that murderous doctrine, this is in the next paragraph, was to remove morality from life. <clears throat> now I think that the, the dichotomy between the moral and the practical is familiar. <clears throat> but the, Galt's making the point that the, the corruption in their minds goes even deeper, that that causes a massive corruption. And this is what I think you have to see in order to see why they find the choice between uh, the morality of life and the morality of death and choosing life as so difficult. <clears throat> so it, it, in that, uh, if, if he continues in that paragraph when he talks about the removing of morality from life, that morality has nothing to say about your actual life, guiding you in a career, in your friendships, romance, uh, in recreation, and so on. It's removed from life because all it has to do is to tell you how to sacrifice. <clears throat> that has nothing to do with living. It has something to do with dying, but not living. <clears throat> and then he says, this is again on 171, paragraph 231, you grew up to believe that moral laws bear no relation to the job of living, except as an impediment and threat, that man's existence is an amoral jungle where anything goes and anything works. And in that fog of switching definitions which descends upon a frozen mind, you have forgotten that the evils damned by your creed were the virtues required for living, and you have come to believe that actual evils are practical means of existence, Forget, forgetting that the impractical good was self-sacrifice. Self you believe that self-esteem is impractical, forgetting that the practical evil was production. You believe that robbery is practical. <clears throat> so this is a deeper corruption. It's not simply that they're, they're viewing real virtues as evil. <clears throat> so it's not that they see Reardon is practical and therefore evil. <clears throat> they can't even make that identification anymore. They see a robber as practical. <clears throat> <clears throat> That's what Galt's telling us here. And, the, and I think it takes a little work to unpack why that, hap why that happens in their mind. It's the, he says it's, it results from a frozen uh, mind and switching definitions. This is what they've been taught. Uh, can people read this? The good is whatever harms my values, which is impractical. And that evil is whatever aids my values, which is the practical. <clears throat> this is what they've been taught. This is the, the morality of death. <clears throat> <clears throat> and this is what uh, no longer, um, it has no relation to living. <clears throat> so which means it's, it's, it's not... Uh, they don't give it any more thought. It's buried in their subconscious. It's a frozen mind that doesn't give any more uh, mental effort, mental thought to try to, uh, I mean, see if there are errors and so on in the view of the good. This is buried in their subconscious, never to be brought back to life or applied to life. So what the, the, the switching of definitions, what happens is in, in the course of their living, they get a glimmer, a sense that say self-esteem actually is good. And we're talking about an actual 
good. I mean, it, it's an actual value because it, after all, it's an aspect of conforming to reality, which is true. So when they get a sense that self-esteem is good, it's, it's based on a, a, a glimmer of what's true. Uh, it's a, based on a glimmer of recognizing reality. <clears throat> but they have no concepts of good and evil. That doesn't apply to life. <clears throat> so it gets processed subconsciously in their minds. <clears throat> that they, they're, they're getting a glimmer that it's good. <clears throat> so that means it harms my values. And that means it's impractical. <clears throat> so the definition has been switched. They're getting a glimmer that it, it actually means conforming to reality. But they can't process that conceptually. <clears throat> they can't do anything with that. And it gets processed subconsciously. And it comes out as self-esteem is impractical. <clears throat> they sense that it's good, and that means it's impractical. And same with robbery. <clears throat> they, get a, they get a real sense, a glimmer, that robbery is impractical. Uh, sorry, is evil. Robbery is, is evil, which is true. <clears throat> it's, it's based on a defiance of reality. But again, they can't process that. They don't have any moral concepts. Morality doesn't apply to life. <clears throat> so it gets processed subconsciously. It gets processed by what they've been taught and now have pushed out as not applicable. That evil is whatever aids my values. <clears throat> so it's practical. So if they get a sense that robbery is actually evil, they now see it as practical. <clears throat> so it's a, it's, they can't even see anymore that Reardon is practical, but has been damned by evil, by their code. They now see a robber as practical. <clears throat> so do you get that idea of the switching of definitions in their minds? <clears throat> so Galt then draws the, the conclusion. This is... Uh, on 171, uh, 232. He says, um, Swinging like a helpless branch in the wind of an uncharted moral wilderness, you dare not fully to be evil or fully to live. <clears throat> and he's talking about real evil there and really living. They dare not be fully to be evil or fully to live. <clears throat> So he says, when you are honest, you feel the resentment of a sucker. <clears throat> and he's talking of honesty as an actual virtue there. <clears throat> and people have a sense that honesty might be something good. <clears throat> and that means it's impractical. So when they're honest, they feel like they're suckers because they're not being practical. The real practical people are the cheaters. <clears throat> but they can't be a cheater, so they're a sucker. <clears throat> And he says, when you cheat, you feel terror and shame. <clears throat> they, think, they think cheating is practical, but they also have a sense that it's a genuine evil. <clears throat> so they experience terror and shame. <clears throat> and he says, when you're, uh, <clears throat> he says, you pity the men you admire. You believe they are doomed to fail. And he means genuine and admirable men. So we're not talking about Mother Teresa or something like that. Um, Think, for instance, of Rostand's view of Cyrano de Bergerac. Um, he has real virtues there, <clears throat> but he, it, he's doomed to fail, and he's, it, he's kind of an object of pity. He's doomed to fail because of his virtues. <clears throat> and Galt says, you envy the men you hate. You believe they are masters of existence. And again, he's talking about genuinely evil people, like James Taggart or Clinton. They're evil, <clears throat> and that means they're practical. <clears throat> So you hate them, but you think they're masters of existence. <clears throat> and so the result is that the people are avoiding both extremes. You dare not fully to be evil or fully to live. <clears throat> both extremes are, fill them with terror. <clears throat> they avoid being genuinely good, so honest, uh, productive, have integrity, and so on. Because to be 100% good would be for them to be 100% impractical. <clears throat> and that means disaster. <clears throat> and they will not be 100% genuinely evil, even though they think that's practical, because it is evil. And they have the sense that uh, when they're cheating, lying, robbing, that they're out of control, that they feel shame and terror. <clears throat> so they're terrorized by both extremes. And so they dare not fully to live and fully to be more uh, to be evil, 
So when God tells them there's this morality of life, well, they dare not go. They dare not fully to live. We're talking about actual life. <clears throat> so they're, they, they're, they're terrorized by choosing it 100%. And we get in this section, uh, this is on 172. Galt, Galt says, if you identify your actual belief, you will find a triple damnation of yourself, of life, of virtue. In the grotesque conclusion you have reached, you believe that morality is a necessary evil. <clears throat> so they have a damnation of themselves, of life, of virtue. <clears throat> well, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, it's a damnation of themselves because <clears throat> they feel guilty for not uh, wanting to practice the morality of death. <clears throat> so they feel, uh, we talked about that, that was the opening point in this section. They feel guilty because they don't want to be moral. So they've damned themselves. They feel guilty because they don't want to die. <clears throat> That's a, I mean, you should never feel guilty about that, obviously. So they've damned themselves. <clears throat> they've damned life because they think that actual evils, cheating, robbing, and so on, is the way to sustain life. <clears throat> and they've damned virtue <clears throat> because they think honesty, integrity, productivity are impractical. <clears throat> and so they get the conclusion that morality is a necessary evil. It's necessary because you need it to curb actual evils, robbing, cheating, <clears throat> which people want to do because it's practical, and uh, this is what you have to curb, and they have a sense that it's, uh, as we said, that it's impractical, that it means uh, being out of control of being feeling shame and terror. So you need morality. But it's evil because what it's doing is curtailing these things like robbing, cheating, and so on, which are actually practical. <clears throat> so it's a, I mean, it's a bizarre conclusion. It's, it's, it's more bizarre than just having the moral, practical uh, dichotomy. And it's a complete subversion of the understanding of morality. Any questions about that? <clears throat> Okay, and that now we can go quickly through the rest of uh, <clears throat> this part three. That's their conclusion, that uh, morality is a necessary, necessary evil. They're afraid of both extremes. They're always seeking the middle of the road. They're always seeking to compromise. <clears throat> and that's what we, the point that Galt makes in the next section, that the, uh, he says that they're attracted to compromise, and it's because of this idea... <clears throat> And that he explains that compromise only serves evil. <clears throat> so as he puts it at the, at the start of this section, this is 172, page 237. A moral code impossible to practice, a moral code that demanded imperfection or death, has taught you to dissolve all ideas into fog, to permit no firm definitions, to regard any concept as approximate and any rule of conduct as elastic, to hedge on any principle, to compromise on any value, to take the middle of any road. And, he's, and, then, and then in this section, we get the point, the familiar point, that compromise only serves evil. <clears throat> and what they need to do is to reject their morality completely. And that's how the section and Galt says on 175, uh, paragraph 244, in order to fight them to the finish and with full rectitude, it is your morality that you have to reject. And that gives us the tie to the next section. <clears throat> they fear rejecting uh, their moral code because their self-esteem is tied to it. <clears throat> and we get here um, the importance of self-esteem. And I think that's, this is a familiar idea too. But this is why I think we can go quickly of, of the idea of what happens when you wire your self-esteem on the wrong moral code. <clears throat> so as Gall puts it, this is 175. Paragraph 245, no value is higher than self-esteem, but you've invested it in counterfeit securities. And now your morality has caught you in a trap where you are forced to protect your self-esteem by fighting for the creed of self-destruction. <clears throat> and this is the, the other reason that they find, uh, even though they've been presented with the morality of life versus the morality of death, <clears throat> it's obvious which one's better. But their self-esteem is wired 
to the morality of death. And this is the other reason they find the choice so difficult. <clears throat> and then what we get in the next section then is the way to get themselves to extricate the, themselves from this problem. It's to how to reclaim their self-esteem, how to wire it properly. <clears throat> And you have to basically reclaim yourself, as I put, put the title of this section, reclaim your self-esteem by reclaiming your mind. <clears throat> as Galt puts it, this is 177, uh, paragraph 253. That choice is yours to make. That choice, the dedication to one's highest potential, is made by, attempt, by accepting the fact that the noblest act you ever perform is the act of your mind in the process of grasping that two and two make four. <clears throat> and that's the root of self-esteem, of uh, <clears throat> using your mind and valuing your mind. <clears throat> and then th throughout this section, then we get, uh, I mean, that, that's the essential step to creating your self-esteem. And then we get, uh, throughout this section, other uh, more derivative but essential uh, steps. So we get ideas like, um, you have to understand that the concept of moral perfection is possible. You have to distinguish between errors and knowledge versus breaches of morality. You have to reject the, the idea of humility and accept the virtue of pride. Um, you have to accept that it's proper for your happiness to be uh, your, your ultimate goal, your purpose. So we get here all uh, the kinds of issues that are necessary to achieve full self-esteem. And then at the end of that section, we get a transition from a discussion of self-esteem to how the world is an image of their destroyed and betrayed self-esteem. So what they, he puts it, what they've done, something like what they've done to their minds. Oh, I, sorry, what you first done to your minds, you then did to reality. <clears throat> and that's the transition to the last parts of the speech where he talks about the rebuilding of the country on the morality of life. And here it's here that we get a discussion of politics, of things like rights and objective government, <clears throat> because that, those, that's going to be the, the, the means of rebuilding. <clears throat> and then we get a discussion of the pyramid of ability after that. <clears throat> that's section G. And I think the basic idea there is um, Galt's telling them that he said how they're going, going to rebuild the world. Uh, it's going to be a world of freedom, rights, capitalism. <clears throat> and he's telling them now, don't think that that's a world where you have no chance, that the, the people of ability are going to enslave you, and so you have to try to enslave them first. <clears throat> that the men of the mind are not exploiters, but benefactors of everyone else, <clears throat> which is the idea behind the pyramid of ability. And then we get the last section that we talked about in the for, first class, where Galt, uh, he's finally spelled out all they need in order to make a choice. So he's spelled out the morality of life and the morality of death. He's explained why the choice is either or. He's explained their fears in making the choice, that it's based on a, on a corrupt view of morality and of a self-esteem wired to the morality of death. <clears throat> He's given them the knowledge to uh, extricate themselves from that and to show them that their fear is not grounded in reality. <clears throat> and now it's the time for them to choose. And that's what we get in the last section. He says, um, <clears throat> he's asking them to stop supporting their own destroyers and to go on strike. Um, <clears throat> and as he puts it uh, towards the end of this on page uh, 199, paragraph 291, such is the choice before you, let your mind and your love of existence decide. <clears throat> and then the last words, as we talked about in the first class too, are addressed to any remaining hidden heroes. Okay, so that's what I have for uh, part three. Are there any questions about the structure of part three, or the, the logic of the structure? Just a sure. comment, as you went through the way uh, Gold is anticipating all the problems that people will have grasped, you know, um, dealing with the morality uh -huh. of life, I mean, 
it, it makes it so much clearer to me why, why people, real people, mm -hmm. who decent people have, can read Ayn Rand, enjoy it, think it's interesting, but not become objectivists. That was, yeah. That's really fascinating. I think so. And I, I, the idea that the, their conclusion is worse than just the moral versus the practical, and that they just have to switch that around and see, well, what they've labeled as moral is uh, actually evil, and what's practical is actually moral. They don't even have a concept of moral. I mean, those concepts, it's far worse than that, uh, that they see morality as a necessary evil. Um, I found that, because I think it's a common phenomenon that people think cheating and lying is, is practical, and that honesty is good but impractical, and so on. And it's hard to get through to mentalities like that. Anything else? <clears throat> okay, let's, we have about uh, 15 minutes left. We can't get to everything on the sanction of the victim, but let's, um, Let's look at some of, uh, in, at, the, at the end of Galt's speech, when he's talking about to, to the heroes, Galt says that, um, <clears throat> my brothers in spirit, check on your virtues and on the nature of the enemies you're serving. Your destroyers hold you by means of your endurance, your generosity, your innocence, your love. <clears throat> and I think all those ideas are illustrated in the novel of how Reardon and Dagny are held by their generosity and innocence and uh, love. And let's take up a few of those. Uh, let's begin with the, we talked about this scene uh, yesterday from the perspective of sacrifice, where Reardon, this was a scene where Reardon uh, and gives money to Philip for his um, the cause, the friends of global progress. And we talked about how this was an uh, uh, inadvertent surrendering of uh, Reardon's convictions and standards, and, and that this was the essence of the kind of sacrifice they're looking for. <clears throat> but if you look uh, at the, the whole context of the scene, it's, it's made clear that Reardon's sacrifice is inadvertent. Um, so for instance, uh, and this is, this is, uh, these kind of ideas you get throughout the first part of the novel, that uh, the, the heroes can't fully identify the, the nature of the evil that they're up against. <clears throat> and that's part of the reason that they are serving it, because they're serving it unwittingly. <clears throat> so this was, this was before uh, he gets the, the idea of uh, Phillips after this uh, money for the Friends of Global progress. And this is what he's thinking about his family. This is on page 45. He said, <clears throat> uh, he, talking about Reardon, he paced the room, his energy returning. He looked at his family. They were be bewildered, unhappy children, he thought, all of them, even his mother. <clears throat> and he was foolish to resent their ineptitude. It came from their helplessness, not from malice. <clears throat> it was he who had to make himself learn to understand them. Since he, hadn't, he had so much to give, <clears throat> since they could never share his sense of joyous, boundless power. <clears throat> and then later he's thinking about uh, a Philip, <clears throat> and this is what Reardon's thinking. He says, and then Reardon thought suddenly that he could break through Philip's chronic wretchedness for once, give him a shock of pleasure, the unexpected gratification of a hopeless desire. He thought, what do I care about the nature of his desire? It's his, just as Reardon metal was mine. It must mean to him what what that meant to me. <clears throat> Let's see him happy just once. It might teach him something. Didn't I say that happiness is the agent of purification? I'm celebrating tonight, so let him share in it. It will be so much for him and so little for me. <clears throat> now you see there uh, the issue of generosity, but you also see the, the issue of innocence, which I think is uh, the deeper, a, a deeper issue. Where the hero, it's 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 kind of the flip side of we talk what we talked about uh, with James Taggart's mentality, that his only direct awareness is of his own mind and how that operates, 
and that operates basically drift and evasion. <clears throat> and so how this made him think that fear is practical, <clears throat> that that's how Galt's mind must work. <clears throat> well, there's a kind of flip side to that with Reardon and Dagny. <clears throat> and that's their only direct awareness is of their consciousness. <clears throat> and that's a healthy uh, functioning consciousness. And when they're trying to understand uh, other people, that's their frame of reference. <clears throat> And so they can't, I mean, it takes a lot of mental work to um, understand that, uh, that a person like Philip or Lillian or James Taggart has a completely different uh, mind than the way Reardon's works or the way uh, Dagny's works. And so it makes them, um, <clears throat> it makes them unable to conceive of evil and its nature. And I think this, this is a, a, a theme that runs through Ayn Rand's uh, novel. So, for instance, if you think uh, in The Fountainhead, there's a line from Mallory on Rourke that he says uh, that Rourke's so healthy that he can't conceive of disease. <clears throat> and this is the similar idea that we get in Atlas, that Reardon and Dagny are so healthy that they can't conceive of uh, the evil that they're up against. <clears throat> and... And in a way, evil has a kind of sort of built-in protection here, that it's sheer monstrosity, it's sheer perversion, makes it even harder for them to believe. And there's plenty of scenes at the start, um, like in the, in the first 200 pages, where uh, Rear is up against an incredible evil, and he just cannot conceive of it. So, for instance, this is with his mother. at uh, This is uh, pages 196, 197 where she's uh, begging him to give Philip a job that he, he can't deserve and doesn't deserve. <clears throat> and this is, this is uh, Reardon's reply. He says, don't ever speak to me again about a job for Philip. I would not give him a, the job of a cinder sweeper. I would not allow him inside my mills. I want you to understand that once and for all. You may try to help him in any way you wish. But don't ever let me see you thinking of my mills as a means to that end. The wrinkles of her soft chin trickled into a shape resembling a sneer. <clears throat> what are they, your mills, a holy temple of some kind? Why, yes, he said softly, astonished at the thought. Do you ever think of people and of your moral duties? I don't know what it is that you choose to call morality. No, I don't think of people except that if I gave a job to Philip, I wouldn't be able to face any competent man who needed work and deserved it. She got up. <clears throat> her head was drawn into her shoulders, and the righteous bitterness of her face seemed to push her words upward at his tall, straight figure. That's your cruelty. That's, what mean, that's what's mean and selfish about you. If you loved your brother, you'd give him a job he didn't deserve precisely because he didn't deserve it. That would be true love and kindness and brotherhood. Else what's love for? <clears throat> if a man deserves a job, there's no virtue in giving it to him. Virtue is the giving of the undeserved. He was looking at her like a child at an unfamiliar nightmare, incredi incredulity preventing it from becoming horror. Mother, he said slowly, you don't know what you're saying. <clears throat> I'm not ever able to despise you enough to believe you mean it. <clears throat> the look on her face astonished him more than all the rest. It was a look of defeat, and yet an old, sly, cynical cunning, as if, for a moment, she had held some worldly wisdom that mocked his innocence. <clears throat> the memory of that look remained in his mind like a warning signal, telling him that he had glimpsed, uh, glimpsed an issue which he had to understand, but he could not grapple with it. He could not force his mind to accept it as worthy of thought. He could find no clue except his dim uneasiness and his revulsion, and he had no time to give it. He could not think of it now. He was facing his next caller seated in front of his desk. <clears throat> and we see in, in, in Reardon a growing uh, realization of, uh, of an overcoming of this innocence and a grasping of uh, <clears throat> the, the nature of evil. <clears throat> but I mean, we get the idea of innocence from different uh, aspects. There's, there's another scene, this is on 202, 203, where, where there's the idea that, 
that looking at evil somehow contaminates you and that, that makes him um, <clears throat> unable to do it. Uh, this is when, this is after they've passed the Equalization of Opportunity Bill and they've ripped Reardon, uh, his ore mills from him. <clears throat> and this, he's thinking about it. This is on 202. The sign at the end of a long road said Reardon Ore. It hung over black tiers of metal and over years and nights, over a clock dricking, ticking drops of his blood away. The blood he had given gladly, exultantly in payment for a distant day and a sign over a road, paid for with his effort, his strength, his mind, his hope, destroyed at the whim of some men who sat and voted. Who knows by what minds? Who knows whose will had placed them in power? What motive moved them? What was their knowledge? Which one of them, unaided, could bring a chunk of ore out of the earth? Destroyed at the whim of men whom he had never seen and who had never seen the tears of metal. Destroyed because they so decided. By what right? <clears throat> he shook his head. There are things one must not contemplate, he thought. There is an obscenity of evil which contaminates the observer. There is a limit to what it is proper for a man to see. He must not think of this or look within it or try to understand, uh, try to learn the nature of its roots. <clears throat> Feeling quiet and empty, he told himself that he would be all right tomorrow. He would forgive himself the weakness of this night. It was like the tears one is permitted at a funeral. And, when, and then one learns how to live with an open wound or with a crippled fa factory. <clears throat> And I would say that um, the, the aspect of innocence, the, the, last, uh, the last stage in overcoming it is when both Reardon and Dagny uh, grasp that the, the looters don't want to live. That that's the last stage. And that that's the corruption they can't believe. That's innocence. Uh, for endurance, you see that all over the novel, too. And that's the idea. I think endurance suggests the idea that even if they, uh, they, they have the, a notion that they're up against real evil, um, it's, for, for various reasons, they're going to endure it and not fight it. <clears throat> Now, for one, I mean, one reason that they don't uh, they don't fight it is that um, they think that that evil, because it's irrational, <clears throat> is impotent, and so it will collapse of its own uh, irrationality, <clears throat> and so it, it, it's not worth the trouble to fight. That that it will go on for a little bit, and then it will disappear, and and they can keep going. So if they just endure it, like say some flies or something like that, um, in a month it'll be gone, and that's the end of that. <clears throat> so for instance, this is on uh, page 85 after they've passed the dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, legislation that dis destroyed Dan Conway, and this is what Reardon says about it. He says, all that lunacy is temporary. It, it can't last. It's demented. So it has to defeat itself. <clears throat> you and I will have to work a little harder for a while, that's all. <clears throat> so they just have to endure it for a while, and then it will disappear. <clears throat> or this is weird in thinking about uh, <clears throat> the, the equalization of opportunity bill before it's been passed. <clears throat> and this is weird in thinking. Reardon did not believe that the bill would pass. He was incapable of believing it. Having dealt with the clean reality of metals, technology, production all his life, he had acquired the conviction that one had to concern oneself with the rational, not the insane, that one had to seek that, that which was right, because the right always won, that the senseless, the wrong, the monstrously unjust could not work, could not succeed, could do nothing but defeat itself. <clears throat> A battle against the things such as that bill seemed preposterous and faintly embarrassing to him, as if he was suddenly asked to compete with a man who cal calculated steel mixtures by the formulas of numerology. <clears throat> Close quote. So one aspect of, of the idea of endurance is that evil, uh, because it's impotent, is seen as insignificant and something that can be uh, lightly bared and it will disappear. And the, the other aspect of it, I think, is that 
to the extent that it's seen as monstrous. If, if you notice, he, he thought uh, the equalization of opportunity bill is a monstrous evil. Given their enormous uh, ability, the enormous productive ability of Dagny and Reardon, they're um, able to endure evils that lesser men couldn't. And this is dramatized all over Atlas II. Uh, for instance, this is after, this is 203, 204. This is after uh, the equalization of opportunity bill has been passed uh, and, and, and um, his, his mills have been taken, uh, sorry, his ore, ore mines have been taken away from him. And as, I, I, as we said, we got the idea in this uh, that I read before that he's too innocent to, um, to, 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 to conceive of the full evil of the, the, the bill and what to do about it. But we also get after that the idea of his ability to endure it. <clears throat> so this is 203. He stood at the window trying not to think, but he kept hearing words in his mind. Reared in ore, reared in coal, reared in steel, reared in metal. What was the use? <clears throat> Why had he done it? Why should he ever want to do anything again? His first day on the ledges of the ore mines, the day when he stood in the wind looking down at the ruins of a steel plant, the day when he stood here in his office at his window and thought that a bridge could be made to carry incredible loads on just a few bars of metal, if one combined a truss with an arch, if one built diagonal bracing with the top members curved to, he stopped and stood still. He had not thought of combining a truss with an arch that day. <clears throat> In the next moment, he was at his desk, bending over, over it with one knee on the seat of the chair, with no time to think of sitting down. He was drawing lines, curves, triangles, columns of calculations, indiscriminately on the blueprints, on the desk blotter, on somebody's letters. An hour later, he was calling for a long distance line. He was waiting for a phone to ring by a bed in a railway, railway car on a siding. He was saying, Dagny, that bridge of yours, throw it in the ash can. All the drawings I sent you, because what? Oh, that, to hell with that. Never mind the looters and their loss. <clears throat> Forget it. Dagny, what do we care? Listen, you know the contraption you called the Reardon Trust that you admired so much? It's not worth a damn. I figured out a trust that will beat everything, anything ever built. Your bridge will carry four trains at once, stand 300 years, and cost you less than the cheapest culvert. I'll send you the drawings in two days, but I wanted to tell you about it right now. You'll see, you see it's a matter of combining a truss with an arch. If we take diagonal bracing and... What? I can't hear you. <clears throat> Have you caught a cold? What are you thanking me for as yet? I, wait till I explain it to you. <clears throat> so you get there that... that, that his new idea just wipes out the, the, the reality of him having lost his ore mills, and he continues on. Uh, I see we're out of time. <clears throat> and, uh, the other, the, it was generosity, uh, endurance, love. Uh, <clears throat> you can find scenes for all of those that dramatize. And I think it's important to see um, that... The, 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 the idea of the sanction of the victim is not a simple principle for them to grasp. And there's a reason why it takes Reardon and Dagny so long to uh, extract themselves from it. <clears throat> um, okay, let me end there. Uh, let me just say I hope this, this taught you something about the speech, but also that it uh, increased your reverence for the mind that created both Gulf speech and Atlas Shrugged. Thanks. Thank you.